All right, so we were right in the beginning of talking about how we form urine. And remember, there are three processes, glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption, and tubular secretion. Glomerular filtration is the first step in urine formation, and this is basically the process of taking the watery component protein-free from the plasma, from the blood, and moving it into the nephron. Now, the whole process is really highly regulated. And what I mean by highly regulated is there are certain times in your life that you probably don't want to make urine. You don't want to expend the energy on making urine. Exercise is a great example, other stressful situations. It's not a great idea to spend a bunch of energy on making urine to being chased by a pair. So we can actually change how much urine is produced. And we can go from a lot of urine being generated to actually a very small amount of urine being produced. We may also want to alter how much urine and how much water is generated uh, in the urine if we're dehydrated or we're not dehydrated. So the whole process is highly regulated. Uh, and part of that regulation comes on what's happening here in the glomerular capsule. So at rest, we have chemicals that are being released. Uh, we're going to call those chemicals vasomotion chemicals. And they're actually always being released. It just depends on what type of situation you're in, if it's going to be a vasomotion that causes constriction or a vasomotion that causes dilation of vessels. So these chemicals are going to be released to cause vasomotion. And vasomotion is just simply changing the diameter of the vasculature of the vessels. So in situations like rest, pressures are low. So blood pressure decreases. Now, as blood pressure decreases, we also have a concomitant decrease in blood flow. However, this is a great time to filter blood uh, and, and to generate urine. We're not exercising. We're not doing any other energy expending activities. This is a great time for us to regulate blood chemistry. So this is actually when we want to have a large amount of blood flow into the glomerular capsule to, fill, to begin the filtration process. So we're under low pressure. So all of these pressures that drive uh, the water from the blood into the urine are going to be lower than if you were, say, exercising. So one of the ways that we can actually counteract this lower pressure is we can, just like with a hose, if you reduce diameter of the hose, what happens to the rate of flow? It increases, and you get much more flow in that situation. So we can actually decrease the pressure, or I'm sorry, in decreased pressure states, we can increase the flow with a little bit of vasoconstriction. I'm out of space. Okay, so increase our vasoconstriction. Now, we don't want to increase vasoconstriction so much that we totally occlude the vessel coming into that glomerular circuit, but enough that we can maintain an adequate filtration rate. So at rest, we actually are going to have the ability to slightly increase the pressure into the system so that we can maintain that filtration rate, even though we're under low pressure in the overall organism. So that's during rest. What about during some sort of stress? And stress could be 
being chased by a bear. It could be getting up ready to do public speaking. It could be standing in front of all female students while they sit there and laugh at you. In the middle of lecture. Darren. 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 <laughs> Yes, I have an accent. I grew up close to Canada. So during stress, I'm going to use exercise as my model. So what happens with exercise? Well, one of the things that we need to know, if I were to draw a graph here to show pre uh, uh, pressures in the blood at the onset of exercise. So we'll bring exercise in here. Normally, what are my pressures? They're about 110 over 70 or 80. We'll call it 70. And that should be your normal pressure. Then at the onset of exercise, systolic pressure actually begins to increase while the diastolic pressure basically maintains or may decrease just a little bit. So, Systolic pressure begins to increase, and we might get up around 135, 150. That means that the whole system is now under a higher state of pressure with exercise. Now, we already know that by increasing exercise, we're going to increase filtration. There's that relationship. But here's the problem. During exercise, I don't want to increase my rate of filtration. I'm not too into making urine while I'm exercising. And that's why most of the time, even if you have to urinate, you go out and you exercise, and you lose the sensation that you have to urinate. And in fact, normally you don't really generate a whole lot of urine. Now, I always say that, and girls are like, well, I pee after I exercise all the time. <laughs> well, you're abnormal. <laughs> now, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you may have some urine in your bladder when you begin exercise, but chances are you didn't produce a whole lot of urine when you set out to exercise. Or exercise is not vigor enough, vigorous enough to really cause a high stress response. In other words, work harder. <laughs> Stop feeding. So during stress and exercise, we have that increase in blood pressure just naturally to supply the blood su uh, sufficiently to all of our working tissues, the heart and the working muscle. But we also have an autonomic nervous system response. Stress always induces a sympathetic-like response. So we have an increase in heart rate, decrease in digestion, and a decrease in urine output. So how do we actually use this autonomic nervous system response to have that decrease in urine production? The autonomic nervous system is actually going to interact with both the afferent and the efferent arterioles. So afferent is what comes in, efferent is what goes out. And we have nervous system supply on both of those arterioles. And under autonomic nervous system sympathetic tone, we're actually going to have an increase in constriction. Now, this sounds a lot like what happens during rest, that we have a little bit of constriction to help maintain blood flow. But now notice that we're constricting both this side and this side. And as we constrict both sides, we're changing pressures in such a way that we actually begin to reduce blood flow through the kidney. So if we have blood flow reduced to the kidney, you'll remember that we had about 1.2 liters of blood at any given time circulating through the kidney, right? Remember that? We called that the renal fraction. We've now just reduced the renal fraction. So we no longer have as much blood flow into the kidney, not as much blood flow into the kidney, it means that 1.2 liters is now back in the general circuit, able to circulate to working organs, organs that are required to maintain homeostasis during that stressful event, whether it's exercise and running, whatever the case may be. So we can increase that blood supply of working organs by shunting the renal fraction away from the kidneys. 
So what will that look like here in the glomerular capsule? Well, it's just simply going to change the glomerular filtration rate. We're going to increase and decrease how much urine is being produced. And by the way, does anyone happen to know what the normal urine production, not urine that's going to be expressed through the urethra, but the normal amount of urine that cycles through the nephron, the normal amount of water cycling through the, ref, the nephron in a 24-hour period? Give me a guess. 46 liters? In 24 hours. In 24 hours. 180 liters a day. 180 liters of water flows through, and most of it is picked back up because you're probably pretty well aware that you're only going to be generating about 1,000 to 2,000 milliliters of urine a day, expressing that uh, from the urinary system. So, that's, so it's coming back in. Yep, so what we're about to talk about, glomerular filtration rate normally is about 180 liters to death. About 178 of that comes back into the bloodstream. About two liters of, blood, of uh, urine every day is produced, sent to the bladder, and then is expressed. So it just yeah, and the processes that recirculate that are really going to be tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion. So we generate this protein-free version of urine. Basically, it's plasma, blood plasma, in a protein-free state. And then as it enters into the tubular portions of the nephron, we're going to begin to modify it. We're going to pull water out. We're going to put some other stuff back in. And so we're going to modify all along the rest of the nephron until we get to the collecting duct. We'll further modify it in some cases through the collecting duct. Once it gets into the renal pelvis, there's no more modification. That is the end state for the urine as it passes through the ureter into the urinary bladder and then through the urethra to express. You should do a lab on that. I actually do a lab on that in human biology where I have them under. So let me give you the results there. So they, they have two different uh, two different solutions that they can choose to drink. One is water and one is soda, cola, or pop, Coke, with a bunch of caffeine in it. So basically I have a caffeinated beverage and I have a caffeine-free beverage. And then, so those are two of the things that they can choose to do. The other thing, um, they can either sit and rest, be in a rested state in the classroom, or they can walk at a moderate pace, or they can actually jog or run. Jessica's smiling because she did this. And we actually have some very fond memories from her class when we did this. But anyway, then I'll tell you about that in just a minute. So, <laughs> so um, you can you can. Drink a caffeinated beverage or a non-caffeinated beverage. You can rest, walk, or, or jog. And what we actually see, so if I just use water, we'll start off with just the individuals who drink water, and then um, they were either rested, they were walking, or they were jogging. And what we find, and then this is urine output. This is basically how much urine is produced. And yes, literally you take a calibrated beaker and you go and urinate it. And then you're like, oh, yeah, it's about 200 milliliters. <laughs> Are you sure you still want to do this lab? As long as I don't stick it. Then I, you have to stick your finger. <laughs> What's the temperature? <laughs> what does it smell like? <laughs> so individuals who rest look something like that. Individuals who walk look something like that. And then individuals who jog. Looks something like that. So really, very little difference between these two points and then a very significant difference there. The main reason, right about there as we transition from walking into jogging, this is where we really turn on that autonomic nervous system. And so now they begin to really contract the arterioles and really reduce the glomerular filtration rate. And by the way, we do this over about a 60 minute time period. So they basically guzzle the water or the, the caffeinated beverage really fast. And then they go out and do their task for 45 minutes to 60 minutes. When they feel the urge to urinate, they come back in, measure their urine production, and we record that data. 
So that's for water. We'll do our nice uh, purple here for cola. Cola actually looks usually something more along the lines of that. And what you see there is there's actually a slight increase compared to rest, a slight increase here compared to walking. And then this really isn't all that different, but slightly different most of the time. And that's just because caffeine is a diuretic and causes increased diuresis and affects uh, how the nephron actually is going to function. And really, the collecting duct is going to function. So that would be the lab that you would do for urine production to look at effects of different levels of exercise. And really, this is autonomic function. And then this is the effects of different chemicals on urine production. So does like, perspiration have anything to do with that at all? Like one that changes the jogging? Stuff? Well, the effect is that we no longer want to produce urine we want to shunt blood elsewhere. One of the places we shunt it to is the surface of the skin to help us regulate body temperature. So we're getting rid of that renal fraction so that we can supply blood to all of the other tissues that need glucose and ATP and all of the other chemicals that are needed for maintaining homeostatic function. So by the way, when we did this experiment uh, in 2012, we had sort of skewed results. The average that the average that an individual in that 60 minute time period is going to be right around 200 milliliters, 150 to 200 milliliters, maybe as low as 25 or 30 milliliters and as high as 300 to 350 milliliters. We had one group that was outstanding. And that's because one of the students came in and was like, yeah, I just urinated 900 milliliters. <laughs> and I was like, no, you didn't. You just lied to the whole class in front of the whole class and everybody caught you and everybody knows it. I won't tell you who it is, but Jessica might tell you sometime later. If you urinated 900 milliliters at a time, that's a whole. That's a, I mean, that's a whole liter. That's. What's the bladder capacity? Um, that's a great question. I actually. Don't really know. Yeah, you can Google real quick and get back to us. My guess is that average bladder capacity is over a liter, or right around a liter. Um, it is related to body size. Women actually do not produce more urine, urine than men, even though a lot of times, colloquially, women go to the bathroom more frequently than men. Part of that is just because the uterus sets on top of the bladder and compresses it. <laughs> okay. What did it what did you say? Well, no, that that may be right. Four hundred to six hundred milliliters. I would I would believe that. Just about a liter. Just under a liter. So if you really urinated 900 milliliters. <laughs> so can they expand though? Because like, the bladder expands so much. Yeah, they, they have more than. I mean, obviously that. Do you think the bladder is expandable? Well, it is. Yeah, it's expandable. So that's what they do with it. 600 milliliters is quite a lot though. What, what are measurements of use? I mean, I just. I guess 400 is how, how big is your, you know, where's That's 500, like, right there. And then I don't really know. Just for the people watching this video, I'm not asking them to inspect their bladders right now. We're using <laughs> bottles. <laughs> Perverts. <laughs> That's 500. Yeah, the whole thing is, is just about 1,000. 400 mils would be there, but it's up to 600. <laughs> yeah, we're looking up to there. That's quite a, that's a good volume. But what about people with like, this nerve injury, like cancer? Yeah, so um, the only place I've experienced nerve retention is in mice. When you give them estrogen, it blows the bladders up. And they still, I, I actually have that data. It's data that I've actually collected. And, uh, 
even even the most retained urinary bladder in a mouse was was not really that much more than a mouse that was not retained in urine. Um, and it was like it was like about it was yeah it was about one liter in the mouse. It, 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 was, a, it was about a percent of the total body. You should just about empty your bladder completely every time you go. If you don't, it actually can create some problems. Um, not everybody can do that, and that's why some people use catheters and things like that is to help facilitate the complete emptying or near complete emptying of the bladder. But then you're immediately putting urine back in there because this whole process is usually continuing. And even, even when you're exercising, you're still producing some. You can't completely shut it off altogether. There's still going to be some blood supply. Do you have a question, Meredith? Just ignore me. That's cool. Whatever. There's no such thing as a stupid question, only stupid people. <laughs> What's that? Um, so why are you That's a that's a great question. Um, another one that I don't really I've never really looked that up before. Um, the one thing that's, see, I think that that question, my, my first impression would be that question would be very difficult to answer. And the reason that is is because athletes are, they're abnormal. They really are. Um, and I was a collegiate athlete, and I was abnormal. It used to be that uh, you could tell who the athletes were on campus because all of us were turning around and I was in models with this, like, 24 seconds sleep with it. Well, anyways, so water consumption and food consumption behaviors in athletes are actually not the same as what they are in the normal everyday population. Food consumption is typically quite a bit different. That's why a lot of times when we talk about eating disorders, most of the time we're talking about athletes. Many athletes have eating disorders, or not many, but it, it's a eating disorders are more are more common in the athletic population than in the normal population. Why? Because most of the time, I mean, think about athletics, you have to have a certain body type to be successful in a lot of athletic, in a lot of athletic events. As a cross country skier, there was no way that I was going to be 300 pounds. <laughs> so, what's that? No, no, they don't want 300 pounds. So, I couldn't just... Eat massive amounts of food without having massive amounts of exercise. And so during the summer when training was a little bit lower, you had to respond and change your diet completely. Right? So most people diet is pretty consistent throughout their lifespan. For athletes, they go through times of large caloric consumption and very low, low caloric consumption over and over again throughout the year and period. Same thing with water. <coughs> During exercise, even though you're not generating urine, you still get thirsty. And you're losing some from sweat, and you're losing some of that water from respiration and things like that. So you're drinking more, but you're also eliminating from other locations besides from the urinary system. So it may be, it may be that, no, there is no additional urination because that water is being removed from other, from other sources, other points. I don't know, that would be my first initial comment. Thought on it. Any other interesting questions to ponder? How big is an elephant's bladder? <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> Okay, so how big 
Well, oh, I think probably relative to body size, it's about equal to humans. Oh my God. All right, so moving on. <laughs> Tubular reabsorption is going to be one of the ways that we modify the filtrate that's produced through glomerular filtration. So the urine that is initially produced in the capsule. <laughs> I just don't know why that happened. <laughs> usually isn't stretching your bladder usually done for people who have urinary incontinence they pee themselves involuntarily <laughs> no some people they don't have to yeah they just pee I'm doing it right now <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> is anyone uncomfortable yet? <laughs> I would assume that maybe, to me, I don't know. That's another question that I really haven't ever considered. I don't sit home at night and, wow, how big is the urinary bladder in humans? What would happen if I stretched it? <laughs> yeah, you are just curious. I would assume that they probably are uh, trying to the, the smooth muscle get the smooth muscle to. <laughs> are you okay? She's <laughs> afraid to urinate now. She doesn't want to put any any fluid in. I would I would think that they probably try to stretch out the smooth muscle to cause it to not be as active as it is so that it's not always squeezing on the bladder causing involuntary urination. <laughs> Let's just try, try this again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, concentrated urine is what's being produced and sent into the capsule. So what that means is a whole lot of salt, sodium <laughs> chloride, yellow pigments. So that initial urine that's produced, if we were to extract that out of the capsule, it would be a very yellowish solution, very concentrated, lower amounts of, uh, uh, of water relative to the amount of, still a lot of water, but lower amounts of water relative to the solutes that are present inside of the solution. So it's this concentrated form of urine, this initial urine, that's going to drain to the convoluted tubules. So the concentrated urine drains into the tubular system. And as it comes into the tubular system, the first portion of the nephron, anyone remember what that was called? Okay, that's the first portion of the tubular system. Okay, and that stands for? Proximal convoluted tubule. So this concentrated urine drains from the capsule into the proximal convoluted tubule. So the PCT interacts with a blood supply called the paratubular capillaries. The 
paratubular capillaries surround the proximal convoluted tubule and act as a point of exchange between this formed concentrated urine and the blood supply. Now, the cells of the proximal convoluted tubule are going to contain microvilli. And hopefully you remember that microvilli are finger-like extensions of the cell membrane. And so this causes an increase in cell membrane surface area. So we have this increase in surface area in contact with that concentrated urine that's just been formed. A lot of times the uh, microvilli, this is one of my proximal convoluted tubule cells, the microvilli are so dense, increasing the surface area so much on the surface of these cells that we're frequently going to refer to this as a brush border. Because it just looks like brush. It just looks very velvety in appearance. And so we have this really high surface area that's in contact with the glomerular filtrate, this concentrated form of newly formed urine. Now these cells in the proximal convoluted tubule are really good at moving sodium. However, sodium is going to be moved in such a way that it's going against the concentration gradient. So what does that mean? Anyone? If we're going against the concentration gradient, sodium requires energy. And how are we going to get that energy? ATP, and so that form of transport is active transport. You actually are doing something. Okay, so we're going to use sodium active transport. We're going to get our energy from ATP. And we're going to transport <coughs> sodium out of the filtrate into the intracellular fluid of the proximal convoluted tubule cells. So let's go ahead and think about this and think about what's happening here as we move sodium from the filtrate into the tubule cells. What's happening to sodium levels in the filtrate? Decreasing. Sodium is matter. Matter has mass. Mass takes up space. So what's happening to space in the filtrate? We're actually increasing the amount of space, which means we have more room for other things, in particular water. So as sodium is moved out of the filtrate, we actually are invariably increasing the concentration of water. Now, sodium, it's an ion. What are ions? Ions have charge. What kind of charge does a sodium molecule have? Positive charge. So as sodium is actively transported out of the tubule, I'm also, in effect, moving a positive charge from the tubule into the proximal convoluted tubule cells. That means that the proximal convoluted tubule cells have an increase in their charge. Opposites attract, right? That means that now I have a mechanism where, as I pull those positive charges into the intracellular fluid, negatively charged ions can follow and piggyback on that active transport. So chloride is actually also going to move across, and other anions, other negatively charged ions are going to move across following the charge of sodium. So just by moving sodium, I'm increasing the concentration of water in the fluid, and I'm increasing the concentration of sodium and chloride and other negative anions, other negative ions, in the intracellular fluid of the proximal convoluted tubule cells. So the chlorine, the chloride, rather, follows the positive charge from the sodium. 
because we are moving matter out of the fluid, we're increasing space for water. And so this begins to create a concentration gradient for water. Now, why does it water begin to flow through here? Why is water not moving across from the intracellular fluid high concentration, I'm sorry, from the tubular fluid high concentration to the intracellular fluid low concentration? There's one big reason that water doesn't cross. Did you say the membrane? The big reason is the membrane. It's not really that permeable to water. Even though a small amount of water is going to cross, water is hydrophilic. Membranes are hydrophobic. They don't mix well. And so water doesn't cross through into the intracellular fluid unless the cell membrane is made to be permeable. What do I need to make it permeable? I need a pathway, and how do I generate that pathway? We had a protein that was discovered in just about 2000. Aquaporins. Okay? So keep aquaporins in your mind. You don't remember talking about that? We talked about that last semester. Aquaporin, if I don't have an aquaporin in the membrane, if I don't have a channel for water, we have about 100,000 molecules of water that can cross the membrane in a given unit of time a second. If I add that aquaporin in, in single file, I can have a trillion molecules of water cross the membrane in that same unit of time. Oh, no. You remember that? No. Okay. So even though we've created a concentration gradient for water, there's no permeability through the membrane, so we're going to just maintain that concentration. <coughs> Eventually, that water is going to filter through an aquaporin to the intracellular fluid, but that's not going to occur just yet. Now, there's actually one additional thing that's going to happen, all centered around the movement of sodium. That sodium movement provides a little bit of energy itself. And the energy that's provided can actually be used in secondary active transport. And so through mechanisms of secondary active transport, we're going to have larger molecules like glucose and individual amino acids that can cross into the intracellular fluid. Oops, supposed to be a five. All right, so we're down to five. Secondary active transport and secondary leaching. So, as we undergo tubular reabsorption, sodium is being reabsorbed into the bloodstream. And remember, I said it seemed like it was a little bit backwards because you would think tubular reabsorption would be stuff reabsorbing into the tubule. But in reality, it's the tubule that's allowing reabsorption back into the bloodstream. Secondary active transport. So sodium crosses, and as sodium crosses in the intercellular fluid, we have glucose, amino acids, other ions, including chloride and other negative ions, and we have um, the, the, uh, the chloride and all of that crossing and setting up our water concentration data. So now the filtrate, which started out as concentrated urine, is actually less concentrated. In fact, now it's even more dilute because there's more water relative to ions than when we started. Not the tubular reabsorption through the proximal convoluted tubule. That's not supposed to be the letter there. Okay, well, how about this process known as tubular secretion? What actually is happening with tubular secretion? Again, this is going to be another mechanism that we can use to mo further modify the urine. Now, tubular secretion, remember, even though it says tubular secretion, we're talking about stuff being excreted from the blood and picked up by the tubules. 
So during tubular secretion, we will experience molecule movement into the tubules. And it will be the capillaries, the blood supply, and we're going to find that it's the capillaries that are associated with the peritubular capillaries and also the capillaries associated with basa recta surrounding the loop of Henle or the nephron loop. <laughs> so these capillaries secrete molecules and those molecules are going to begin to build up in the other tissue in the kidney, the non-nephron tissue in the kidney and will eventually be picked up by the tubules. So the tubules pick up those solutes. And as the tubule picks up the solutes, obviously this is going to begin to further modify the urine. Now, how exactly are these being picked up and what exactly is being picked up through tubular secretion. How and what is being picked up is going to define how the movement or the transport occurs. Okay, so the movement mechanisms is going to be solute dependent. We're going to have some solutes that undergo active transport. So we're going to have to spend a little bit of ATP to move some of those things across. We're also going to have some passive diffusion using concentration gradients rather than pumps to move sites from one location to another. So both of those are going to be options. And in all reality, most of these molecules that are being secreted and moved into the urine, remember the filtrate was very selective. It was selective based off the size. But there's going to be some molecules that we want to excrete in the urine that are relatively large. And so it's going to be tubular secretion from the paratubular capillaries and some from the vasa recta of complex molecules. So we're going to have movement of complex molecules through tubular secretion. And it's going to include things like exogenous substances. And so when I say exogenous substances, I mean substances that aren't naturally produced by the body. You're putting them in. Drugs would be an example here, both pharmaceutical drugs and then also for all of you pot smokers, your narcotics. <laughs> Certain toxins, you may consume toxins with your food, you may consume toxins just from exposure. Some of those toxins are going to be secreted into the urine to be expressed from the urine. Um, I don't, I was just, I don't know, I think this, I'm like, when people go on like, pots, and like, it has like a bad bath, and so I guess that, that could be like this, that's this. Like, because I mean, they also like must get all the toxins. Yeah, they're probably the same people who are putting the, the toxins in. <laughs> yeah. I need to detox and smoke some pot today. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, the idea is that 
there are all there. You're right. There are bad, and they probably really don't do a whole lot. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're eating gasoline, you probably want to <laughs> give yourself a little time to get rid of it. But um, there's this idea that oh, we eat so many preserved foods now that if we don't, take it, <laughs> when we when we die, we're going to just basically be a hot dog and we'll <laughs> Oh my gosh! <laughs> um, yeah. I'm not as concerned about our food supply as some people are. You can't really tell. Yeah, there are some things that maybe aren't good to put on our food and distribute to the to the national population. Some pesticides, but a lot of them you can just wash them off and clean them up, clean them up really well and, and you get rid of them. The other thing too is a lot of the chemicals that people are so afraid of, this amount of but the dosage that you get exposed to is so minimal that you really have no no effects. Bisphenol A, you've all heard of BPA, and you may have a water bottle here that 20 years ago would have been produced with BPA, and now it's much more expensive because they're being produced with hard, uh, other plastic plastic hardeners. BPA was used because it was a cheap plastic hardener, and over the last 20 years, it's basically been eliminated. You can't sell BPA products in the United States. Um, anything that's going to be used by little kids, babies, and infants, and things like that, so baby bottles and that sort of stuff, it's completely banned in Europe. Um, and the whole idea was, well, BPA is an environmental estrogen, and the body can't excrete it well enough and fast enough, so it has estrogenic effects. Well, if you go and you read the literature, and they can create tumors in mice, and I'm not denying that, but the dose that they're giving them is astronomical. It's a huge dose to cause the effects that are, are being caused. In fact, I went through and I did the process because I hear this all the time and I'm interested in, in endocrine and estrogens. And so I said, so if you get an old bottle, an old Nalgene bottle, they were made with bisphenol A. And you look at the bottom, it should have a number seven on there and that indicates that if it's a bottle that's about 10 years old, it probably has bisphenol A. We actually can measure how much bisphenol A is deposited into whatever you're drinking from the bottle. And uh, I did. I went through and I did all of the math to say, okay, if I take this bottle and I set it on the table, fill it up with water, allow bisphenol A to leach into the water bottle, and I drink it, am I getting an equivalent dose that they're giving me these four mics that cause cancer? Then? And the answer is no. It would actually take about 30 years. So I'm going to take my Nalgene bottle, fill it up with a liter of water, put it down on the table, let it sit there for 30 years, and I'm going to come back and I'm going to drink it. And I'm going to give people it to one dose that they normally give those mice. They normally give the mice weeks and weeks and weeks of doses. So I would, to, to replicate the experiment, I would have to take about 40 Nalgene bottles, fill them all up with water, if they contain bisphenol A, let them sit on the table for about 30 years, and come back and every day, 40 days, drink one of them. And I might get cancer. <laughs> so um, I'm not as afraid of that kind of stuff. And so detoxification diets, yeah. I mean, what are you really getting rid of? Well, I probably have had um, one Nalgene bottle in the last 24 years, and I, there's a lot of this in the lane. So I'm going to get rid of it. <laughs> I'm not listening to the video. <laughs> <laughs> At first, I probably should go smoke some pot. Got to go vote for Obama, too. <laughs> that part might get deleted. <laughs> no, it probably won't. <laughs> <laughs> so in addition to drugs, pharmaceuticals, and narcotics, the toxins that we're exposed to both metabolically and uh, exogenously, and then foreign debris, that's all going to be secreted from the paratubular capillaries into the urine to allow for to allow for it to be gotten rid of. Then there's also, just give me one more minute here, maybe I'll tell another joke or two. <laughs> There's also endogenous molecules, molecules that are naturally going to occur. And most of these are excreted through tubular secretion into the urine, things that are going to help out with acid-base balance, 
And that's what you see there with the hydrogen. We're going to modify how much hydrogen ion is deposited in the urine to help maintain a normal blood pH, so acid base uh, balance homeostasis. Um, and then also potassium balance. Potassium, you'll remember, is typically high inside of the cell. It flows out of the cell during generation of action potential both in the heart and in um, the nervous system. And so if we don't manage potassium and we allow potassium levels to increase in the cell and the extracellular fluid, we actually begin to modify how the heart will work and how the nervous system will work, and we can get into some real problems like that. All right, so I'll stop there. Oh,